Chandri, you seem to move between longer narrative poems um, and these sort of lyric moments. Was that something you were thinking about as you arranged the book? No, absolutely <laughs> not. No, the book kind of took its own shape, and I suppose there's one section that's very historical and it uh, draws upon different um, people, per personas from history. And so I kind of set that up chronologically, and so there are some lyric poems and some longer narrative poems, and they just sort of alternated in a nice way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do both, and, and I feel like I'm more of a lyric poet. I'm more interested in capturing that present moment and the intensity of the experience, but in the historical section, also trying to render these people as human so we can see the past as an extension of ourselves rather than the sort of distant thing that happened a long, long time ago to somebody else. Yeah. Why do you think that's important to see the past as an extension of ourselves? So that we can connect with what happened. We need to be able to talk about it and to imagine ourselves in that place, mm. what were our choices have been. I have one poem that's in the voice of Pocahontas, and I'm always leery of writing in uh, the perspective of someone from the past because it's hard to, from our perspective, impute motives to those people then and really understand what they were facing and how they were thinking. But to understand that her choices were really limited, you know, and she, I think she did the best she could with what was available to her as a woman and, and as a, a Native person. But she's been um, animated into this American myth that has so little to do with her reality as a human being. I was trying to kind of get at that. Another theme that keeps reappearing and weaving the boundary is the idea of silence or historical erasure. What, um, and the other thing that strikes me when you talk about your poetry is that you seem to have uh, such an optimism about the power of language to speak to that um, silencing and that erasure. Can you just talk a little bit about, about that and what your hopes are? Mm -hmm. that poetry can do in the face of that, that silence? Yeah, well, I think it connects, too, to my work. For the last eight years, I've focused at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities on really getting into the uh, expansion of what we know about history and adding perspective to that story so that we aren't just telling what I call happy history, mm -hmm. you know, something that makes people feel really good about the past, but understanding the roles of everybody in that. And so... In my poetry, as well as in my work, I'm trying to um, add depth um, to that experience and connect people. And, and that's what I believe most deeply that it's through language that we communicate, you know, as well as you know, facial expression and gesture and, and all of that. But, but it's a channel for communicating. That's why it was devised. And so we use it to try to connect. Someone once said that poetry is ultimately an act of optimism, even if you're writing really depressing material, because you have in your mind the idea that you're reaching out to someone. You know, you're not isolating completely. And I'm very good at isolating because I'm an introvert, but it's my way of, of trying to correct historical injustices and connect people to what happened then and what can happen in the future. The final section of your book is, ends with the long poem, The Naming. What was the inspiration for that poem? Well, it put itself together over time. It's a poem in sections that's about the different ways that Native people use or have used language. So how powerful it is, how the story itself calls into being the characters that are mentioned by name. And so the idea of naming is a very powerful act of calling into being. It's something we don't think about words as being that powerful anymore. We used to, and people called it witchcraft or magic. But it's the, the notion that through language we make things happen. Stories come into being as we tell them. And so there's that going on. There's this whole sense of native language and the different languages that native people spoke. There are many little snips of different languages in that poem. And that was a challenge in terms of research because I don't speak those languages. So I had to find a speaker who could corroborate what I was doing. Um, but also this idea that when a language is lost, what gets lost with it. And we have 
place names in native languages like Mississippi that have no context anymore. Mm. So what is that? It's just a, a vestige of something huge that's no longer there. The poem ends um, with silence, and then, and because it's the last poem in the book, the book ends with silence. Um, the final line is, settling again into the silence we become. Well, can you talk about the choice to end in silence? I struggled so hard with that word. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if it should be into the sound we become or into the silence we become, and I went back and forth many, many times. I've even published it into the sound we become mm -hmm. because I've got this dust swirling and things are happening and all of these images are floating around. And I thought, well, what it really is the end result. It is silence because sooner or later our civilization comes to an end or our language and way of being in the world comes to an end. And so if I'm going to choose the, the real rather than what I want as an ending, then I have to stick with silence. Mm -hmm. And there's something healing about silence that our culture doesn't always recognize. I was saying earlier that some people I know feel like it's antisocial to be quiet. And in a Native sense, that's strange. Sometimes Native people will just come and sit by each other, and that's a form of support. It's not like they say, oh, I know how you feel, or, you know, and yap, 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 and, and fill that silence up. It's just a way of being in the world and appreciating that being without having something to say. Ending poems is really hard. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any advice on poem ending? I want to punch somebody in the gut at the last line. And so I try very hard to come up with powerful endings. And sometimes I succeed. Um, I'd just love to hear more about your process, because it seems like there's, there's an act of waiting for the poem to come to you, but then also making, making choices. And I just wanted to hear a little bit about, about your process. I think that both are at work in this book. There were instances where I felt like certain stories were almost lining up to be told you know, with the different historical figures and so on, things that, that really struck me. <clears throat> and then there's also this idea that if you wait for it, um, the, the line forms itself sometimes, and I have to be patient. I can't force that. I noticed throughout your book that there's such a variety of uh, uh, line lengths. You know, you'll have these poems with really long lines, and then... Um, sort of shorter, tighter poems. How do you think about line breaks? I'm not really sure. I'm, I look for form as I'm writing. I like form a lot. And many of my poems are in stanzas or in various forms. And I want there to be a, a visual impact on the page as well as a linguistic impact uh, orally. Um, but some poems just seem like they're, they're coming in a way that's, that's really tight and focused on every single word. And then other poems, I don't know, there's just a more narrative structure. And that's something that's come to me over time. I didn't used to have it. I, I took a course with Charles Wright, and I think he really helped to focus my attention on lineation, where before I was just... You know, and I would send something off, and the editor would send it back and say, I think it would look better like this. <laughs> it took me years yeah. to get to this place. But in each case, when I've done a book, it's been after a huge medical ordeal, and I felt very focused. Mm. Because having cancer, which I've had twice, reorders your priorities very quickly. And what I've come away with in both cases is notion that there's still something to say and I want to say it and I want to make sure I say it quickly but say it right so that it uh, transforms people if it can.